Welcome. My name is Allison Grayson. I'm with Independent Sector, and I want to welcome everybody to a special deep dive version of our Week in Washington, which is a webinar series exploring advocacy and policy impacting nonprofits during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's webinar is titled uh, the 19th Amendment Centennial Celebration, and we're all here. Um, some of us are really gussied up, some of us just have earrings, but we're all here to celebrate um, and, and really explore how history over 100 years ago continues to impact the work of nonprofits today, particularly when it comes to securing safe, secure, accessible elections in 2020. Um, this program is a part of independent sectors effort to kick off our campaign to encourage nonprofits to participate in National Voter Registration Day, which is on September 22nd. Uh, as a normal feature in Week in Washington, um, we also do a policy update of just what on earth is happening in Washington, D.C. Um, and because it's really important to um, motivate voters by helping them understand what is happening in their lives, or how policy is impacting their lives, we're going to keep that in this program today. Um, it just means the program is a bit longer, so we're going to run a full 60 minutes. So today, in celebration of women's empowerment, we're joined by six incredible speakers. Um, I have my colleague and co-moderator, Nisha McGee with Independent Sector, Maggie Bush with League of Women Vo Voters, Adoja Asamoa with ABA Consulting, Christy Felling with Share Our Strength, and last but certainly not least, our partners, Heather Mead and Jessica Cameron, both with Washington Council, Ernst & Young. So I'm going to start really quickly um, and do some housekeeping. And so a part of our call feature today, all lines are currently muted. And we will pause at the end of this webinar. We have a lot of content to get through, but we will pause at the end um, for questions. Um, if you have a question though, please don't wait until the end. Please go ahead and type it in the Q&A box um, in your Zoom uh, window, or you can email publicpolicy at independentsector.org. Uh, and we will try to get as many questions as possible answered. Uh, this event will be recorded and it will be sent um, to you 24 hours uh, after this webinar. And when you leave today's uh, webinar, we'd really ask you to fill out a survey. Let us know what you think. This is what helps us create content tailored to your needs and interests in the future. So with that, I want to um, acknowledge that today, um, the topic of today's webinar is discussing how we live in a history-driven present. And um, this makes, makes it really important to acknowledge the indigenous land upon which nonprofits work to build uh, and build more vibrant communities. Um, but I wanna read something that I was looking at about uh, what does it mean to do land acknowledgement? Because I think it's really relevant to our, our topic today. Is it says, remembering the role of, of history today can help us avoid making policy mistakes which even if inadvertent, can have de devastating consequences. Land acknowledgments remind us to be intentional in our relations to the land and with the people indigenous to that land. Um, I think that really aligns with what we're talking about with the centennial celebration. So I wanted to share that. And, and uh, to, to begin that acknowledgement, I want to say I am joining the call from Alexandria, Virginia, which is the ancestral home of the Piscataway people who are still living in the area and working to re reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also want to acknowledge that the buildings and places we inhabit in the larger Washington DC metropolitan area were built by enslaved people. And we think that these acknowledgements of history are really important because we still see them in different forms today. And the sector is still working uh, to resolve some of these, these issues. So now, we get to start our program. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Nisha, who's going to start with a poll. Nisha? Nisha, I think you're muted. I think Nisha may be having some technical difficulties. Um, so let's see, Micah, do we have the poll set up? You're unmuted, Nisha. Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay. Sorry. There we go. Yes. So again, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we have an exciting program, as Allison already stated. Um, this essentially is just a tool that we're using to gauge to see how our nonprofits are integrating advoc their advocacy efforts into their policy agenda. Um, so the question, as you guys can see, is how has your nonprofit integrated voter engagement initiatives into your organization's work in the past? And we'll give you guys a second um, to go ahead and answer that. 
And feel free to use the comments as well if you know you have any specific ideas that you'd like to share. Perfect. Do we have all of the results in? So thus far we have seven, 44%. Uh, they say yes, they have integrated some form of advocacy initiatives um, into their policy agenda and 56% said no. Interesting. Allison, if it's okay with you, are we gonna, can we go ahead and? Yep. I think that's great context for us going forward as speakers. We can we can understand, you know, where are people in their journey around understanding voting and how the sector fits into that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, Heather and Jessica, and we're going to get a download of what on earth is happening in Washington, D.C., which makes voting so important. So Heather and Jessica, take it away. Thanks, Allison. And I think we're going to get some slides going here so you guys can follow along at home. Um, you know, we're going to try to spend as little time on this as possible today. There's a lot happening in Washington as Congress is returning from their August recess with the House coming back um, on the 14th and the Senate coming back next week. So what we thought we'd do is walk quickly through where the negotiations are on the next COVID package and then end with a little bit of an update on the current electoral process that we're in. Um, as we segue to our exciting topic for today. So Jessica, why don't I kick it over to you and you can start with a little bit of an update on the current negotiations. Sure, well, while we're waiting for the slides, thanks everyone for being here. It's great to, um, to be on the webcast. Um, as far as kind of where we are um, to give you a level set. Um, so over the past few months due to the coronavirus, there's been a um, significant amount of stimulus that's been passed by both houses of Congress. Um, to the tune of about $3 trillion, both with what's called the CARES Act. I, use, I call that kind of the big kahuna of stimulus legislation we've seen this year, as well as several other bills um, going forward. And um, this has provided um, several different types of aid to those in need, including um, nonprofits and small businesses through what's called the Paycheck Protection Program. We've had um, significant employment assistance um, through a $600 bonus payment. Um, for those that um, were um, unfortunately laid off and unable to find work during this time, um, as well as increased or changes to the Family Medical Leave Act um, to allow those that have been affected by the virus personally or for family members that they take care of um, to allow for more additional leave. And I think we're about to see some slides up. Great. If you want to go to um, slide one, please. Um, so like I mentioned, um, a multitude of different pieces that we're looking at um, so far. Um, now, going forward, there's obviously still a lot of people that are hurting, especially women, um, through child, child care needs, um, work, and other economic factors. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, it's going to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of future legislation. Um, so there's been, it seems like a need for um, additional stimulus legislation um, after the CARES Act. And so there's kind of two different pieces are two different offers that we've seen up on the table. One being what's called the HEROES Act, kind of the democratically controlled house version um, of um, additional benefits. Um, and then the Senate HEALS Act. Um, unfortunately, both houses of Congress haven't been able to um, uh, kind of combine their bills into one package. And so we've seen kind of a stall um, in terms of um, you know, future stimulus legislation going forward. Um, where we see this kind of at the crux of it is um, debate over how much to give or what kind of benefits to give in terms of an extension of the unemployment benefits that were part of the CARES Act. Um, uh, so here's some, just a couple of the other pieces as well. Um, there's been questions over state and local funding that Democrats have been very um, focused on, liability protection, so um, ensuring that nonprofits, um, universities, small businesses um, can um, have a liability waiver for those that come into their, um, into their um, stores or organizations. 
um, so they can continue to work on um, kind of uh, you know picking the economy back up and going, as well as other areas with regards to testing and Medicaid. I don't know if Heather has anything else to add in this slide too, but um, this is kind of where we are in terms of um, kind of future legislation and what we want to what we're looking for um, going for the next few weeks. So as we turn to the next slide, I think what we're going to see this week, right, is that um, as we're entering this fall time zone, we're expecting Senate Republicans to try to put a much skinnier package on the table. So the House, you know, started with an over $3 trillion package. The Senate countered with a $1 trillion package that they weren't able to get enough votes for. And now they're actually going backwards to a $500 billion package. So in that package, we're not likely to see a lot of the priorities that nonprofits have put on the table. We're not likely to see a lot of taxes, changes around charitable giving. Um, but we are likely to see a little bit around PPP funding and possibly even something around liability protections. So as we look through the end of the year, just a reminder that this is an election year. So we're at that Labor Day holiday. We mentioned when Congress is returning, but the next thing we're gonna see is we're gonna kind of get into that campaign season with that first presidential debate happening on September 29th. This part of the election year is really going to drive a lot of the schedule in Congress. The next big deadline we have is at the end of September with the expiration of government funding. That means it's an opportunity to shut the government down if Democrats and Republicans are unable to agree on how to fund the government. Fortunately, though, despite this cliff we're creating for ourselves, it also creates the opportunity to potentially push that coronavirus package together along with the potential government uh, funding extension. This could create a vehicle for things like postal service funding and some of the other things that have been of interest to nonprofits. So we'll be watching that deadline closely. Of course, in October, we're expecting, some of us may be hoping, um, that Congress goes back home to finish their campaign season and we can all watch these debates in uh, the peace and quiet of our homes while Congress is back home working on their re-election campaigns until we get to that November 3rd election day. Just two other points as we think about what this lame duck session might look like for Congress. Uh, just a reminder that there are some expiring tax provisions that will expire at the end of December and some health care provisions that expire in November that may need some additional action before we get to that January timeframe. So Congress will still have some work to do. Next slide, please. Jessica, let's turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the election in our last three minutes here. Great. Thanks, Heather. And, you know, we would be remiss to not talk about kind of what's going on in the elections and how that's affecting women, both in terms of voting, which I know that um, the other speakers will touch on, um, but also just in terms of what the makeup of Congress looks like. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, a statistic I really like is that at the moment, um, in 2018, we saw a record number of women um, run for office um, in Congress. And that trend is continuing this year. Um, there are about 127 um, women that are elected um, within um, the U.S. Congress. Um, I should note, though, um, so that makes under about just under a quarter of the individuals um, that hold up the seat. Um, remember, women make up half the population. So as far as kind of numbers go, that's still um, a pretty low number, number, although we've seen that number increase over the last couple of years. Um, one thing I also would like to mention is that um, of those 127 women, only 48 are women of color. Um, and so with regards to the numbers, I think it's important to look at kind of all those pieces and how that slices out um, in terms of going forward and the progress that we're looking at. Um, so this just gives you an idea of kind of where the makeup is in Congress. Obviously, we have Senate Repub or Republicans that are um, control the Senate. We have um, then uh, Rep Democrats that control the House. We have a split um, kind of um, uh, leadership um, here, as well as, the, as well as a Republican in the White House. Um, if you go to the next slide, so with a, uh, the 2020 presidential election, that's obviously going to be, um, um, you know, an interesting um, piece in terms of who will occupy the White House, whether that will be Trump and Pence or that will be Biden and Harris. Also, of course, important to note, Kamala Harris is now the first um, woman of color to, um, to run for the vice presidency seat, seat um, and so that's a significant thing as well. Um, so, but in addition to the, the bid for the White House, if you go to the next slide, um, it discusses kind of some of the key um, Senate races that are going on. Um, you see that Republicans have a pretty uphill battle in terms of the number of seats that they're um, trying to maintain 
and there are a number of battleground um, races that are going forward. Um, and women have um, pretty significant parts to play in those races. So for example, in Maine, Susan Collins has um, a pretty uphill race in her um, district. You have Martha McSally, um, a Republican um, in Arizona. Um, also um, important to know other um, races, including Colorado, Georgia, have some pretty um, um, uh, seats where they were maybe traditionally Republican or Democratic um, several years ago, um, are really starting to see some competitive races. Um, so I don't know if Heather has anything to add, but I think that gives you a good picture. Uh, this will definitely be an exciting election. We're definitely going to um, predict some change, um, especially in the Senate, where um, while the House might continue to be um, um, or is likely to be Democratic, the Senate is really up in the air. And either way, you're going to see um, a very close margin in terms of who occupies and gets control um, of that chamber. No, thanks, Jessica. I think we've got a lot of great stuff to discuss today, and so we should probably keep moving. Great, thank you guys both for giving us wonderful context for the next phase of our conversation, which is a little bit of a look back and then how that applies to where we are today. Um, so I'm looking to see where are we? Nisha, I think, I think you're the next facilitator up. Yes, yes, um, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you guys both. So um, next we will have a brief video um, as we are celebrating this pivotal milestone of celebrating our centennial anniversary. We also have to acknowledge that the 19th Amendment was not as inclusive as it should have been. Um, and with that being said, we need to also make certain that as we are preparing to cast our ballots for 2020, that we're learning from those mistakes and also making certain that we are working to advocate for every eligible voter to be able to cast their ballot. Um, Micah, do you, can you go ahead and roll the video? This video is called 19th Amendment Celebration, Its Passage, Fight for Its Promise. Are you missing some audio? Yeah, yeah, Mike, I think we're missing the audio of it. Um, and it starts from the very beginning. No matter how many times you rehearse and practice something, right, Allison? <laughs> Technology is just not on our side today. <laughs> A folding chair. There we go. Can we start it over one time? If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. These words and others mark the story of black women for ages. And they also foreshadow the hollow victory in celebrating the 100th anniversary passing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. You see, while it was for women, unfortunately, what it meant was white women. From 1920 to 1965, that's what women's political empowerment looked like. So we will speak our, our truth. truth. Black women like Sojourner Truth, Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and all the founding members of the then recently organized Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated fought two battles. One for their gender and another for their race within that gender. When the call was sounded to protest the newly elected President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration by suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, it was done with the face of hurtful discrimination practices among the suffragists themselves. Journalist and anti-lynching crusader Ida B. Wells said of leading suffragist Frances Willard that she unhesitantly slandered the entire Negro race in order to gain favor with those who are hanging, shooting, and burning Negroes alive. And while she wasn't the only one, using black lives as bargaining chips and fighting over who is more included or who is more excluded, <laughs> I've seen this movie before. Last week, really. Yet African American club women kept on keeping on. Those of our past saw the vote as part of a much broader range of social, economic, and political issues surrounding their communities. But hey, 
Black women were intersectional before your little think pieces made it cool. Someone we might have called Miss Anne a hundred years ago could be the Karen of today. But we digress. Shortly after 1965, Fannie Lou Hamer and Shirley Chisholm and Flo Kennedy immediately started showing us the way. But it will still be another 10 years in 1975 before most Latinx, Native, and Asian American women could vote. And that right to vote meant that these women would become the leaders themselves as mayors, senators, speakers of state assemblies, and members of Congress. And so we march on, not apart, but together. Not with petticoats, but in pantsuits. And braids, and locks, and sneakers, and crocs. And from our homes and our phones, online, it was black women. Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, who helped us turn the words Black Lives Matter from a hashtag to a movement. As Mary Church Terrell said in 1904, I should answer unhesitatingly, it is a magnificent work our women are doing to regenerate and uplift the race. We celebrate the 19th Amendment's passage while we continue to fight for its promise. Thank you, Micah. Celebrating the passage of the 19th Amendment while also making certain that we're still fighting for the promise that was originally intended. Um, so our next panelist um, is actually a member of my sorority, the sorority that we actually just saw in the presentation, um, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. This is my soror, my mentor. Um, she's a phenomenal woman, Ajwa. There she is. Okay, thank you so Making much. sure we're not having any more technical difficulties. No more technical difficulties. <laughs> um, greetings, everyone. My name is Ajwa. I self-identify as a racial and gender equity champion who just so happens to be a social uh, impact and political strategist and, of course, uh, the sorority sister to this one over here. Um, I wear too many hats to name them all, and without boring you all uh, with the details of my bio, I will simply say that if it is about lifting Black women, I am about it. Uh, albeit virtually, it is truly an honor and pleasure uh, to share this time with my fellow esteemed panelists and with you all. Uh, before I begin my brief remarks, though, I want to just thank the leadership of the independent sector, just because uh, it should be lost on none of us that there was obviously a commitment to ensure that diverse uh, voices and perspectives are represented here today. Um, I only have a few minutes to speak, so I'm trying to uh, get through these slides as quickly as possible. If we can put them up, um, Micah, then I will try to go through them as quickly as possible, uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, I love art, uh, and so I am going to try to tell this story uh, in the context of art. Okay, first slide. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time just highlighting just a few of the lesser known truths about the uh, suffrage movement, and more specifically, uh, that well-known suffrage march of 1913. Uh, this year, while many white women nationwide have been and will undoubtedly continue to celebrate 100 years of having the right to vote, uh, we know that 1920 uh, doesn't represent the same thing for Black women. Uh, the hypocrisy of it becomes painfully obvious against the backdrop of a pandemic that disproportionately impacts Black and Brown women, uh, and quite frankly, it underscores the reality of injustice when I think about the fact uh, that Breonna Taylor is no longer with us, but her killers uh, are still free. Um, it's a reminder that although Black women, being the pragmatic activists uh, that we are, uh, who understood the concept of intersectionality before the, the term was even coined, uh, the sacrifice um, you know, that we made for a concept of democracy that didn't even include us uh, should be certainly noted. So here you have um, Mary McLeod Bethune in her younger days in an interpretation uh, that was by Charles White of her last will and testament. Uh, I will leave the full interpretation up to you. Nope, go back to the first one. Um, I'll leave the full interpretation up to you, but it symbolizes um, a piece she wrote before she transitioned, essentially stating, I leave you uh, love and hope for the future. Um, it speaks to our intergenerational approach to activism. Uh, you see her as a baby, her father to the left, her mother to the right, um, and an image of my um, colleague, uh, Rhonda Briggins, who serves as the National Social Action uh, 
commission chair for Delta and then my national president and of course um, our first lady. Next slide. You'll see some of our um, invaluable activists pictured here. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who of course put it all on the line, Ella Baker and Eleanor Norton's Holmes, uh, Eleanor Norton Holmes and Stokely Carmichael are all represented here. Uh, this picture was taken on the steps of the Democratic National Convention in 1964 when they spoke out and she actually testified at the Rules Committee when they didn't uh, seat the interracial delegation from Mississippi called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, I'll go ahead and disclose not to cause any confusion. I am a Democratic strategist, uh, but I included this video, uh, this photo because of the interconnectedness of the overall struggle. Uh, void of situating activism in its proper historical context, we can't have any real meaningful conversation about the suffrage movement, especially without pointing to the mere contradiction of it all. Uh, and because I mentioned context, I should probably note here that last year uh, marked the 400th year of the forced removal of black people uh, from our continent and uh, it, enduring a middle passage that uh, is known to many as the Af African Holocaust, uh, where many of us were dehumanized in ways that others can't even imagine. So it's impossible for many Black women to share in the excitement uh, when we're still here fighting for those rights uh, that others will celebrate and against an anti-woman, anti-Black, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-everything that is not white, male, straight, and wealthy administration. Uh, so this very year, ironically, uh, Black women will be in battle mode, not celebrating at fancy receptions. Next slide. This picture uh, of Minty Ross, or Moses or Harriet Tubman, as she's also called, uh, who passed away in March of 1913, was chosen because she's so critically important um, to acknowledge her foundational work regarding moving Black women uh, in the fight for freedom. Uh, this photo, just as a, as a note, was recently discovered and is in the collection of the Library of Congress, shared with the National Museum of African American History and Culture, where it's currently prominently displayed. I love it because it's uh, of the age of when she was actually doing the work. She passed away just two months after Rosa Parks was born, so she didn't get a chance to see it, but she actually did live when the next generation of activists were born. Next slide, please. Oh, no, let me go back. I'm sorry. Um, I should go through these very quickly. Uh, the 13th Amendment abolishes enslavement and involuntary servitude, except if convicted of a crime. Uh, the 14th Amendment um, establishes due process and equal protection under the law. The Citizenship Amendment, it is known as Section 2 actually empowers what becomes the Civil Rights Act of 1957 and again, of course, of 1964. The 15th Amendment, uh, voting is protected against unconstitutional restrictions. Uh, Section 2 empowers what becomes the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, as a non-lawyer, to put this simply, Section 1 says what our rights are. Section 2 says Congress has the power to pass laws to help enforce our rights outlined in Section 1. Civil rights movement was essentially uh, about getting Congress to use the Section 2 to enforce our rights. That's why the civil rights movement it, uh, is referred to, at least in my circles, as the Second Reconstruction. Between the legal end of enslavement and government sanctioned oppression known as Jim Crow, it is the Reconstruction period uh, where the Constitution was amended three times. And it's the reason that we call the first Reconstruction uh, is because 100 years later, Black people had to go uh, enforce this country to realize the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, I should note that it was the 15th Amendment uh, that should have resulted in our voting rights, um, and so there should have been no need for the 19th Amendment. If you actually read it, uh, there is no reference to gender. Uh, it was a flawed interpretation of it. Uh, that is the reason for the 19th Amendment. Next slide. Sojourner Truth, uh, intentionally placed here for what I hope are obvious reasons. Again, intersectionality was something Black women have had to deal with uh, in the U.S. The suffrage movement was not welcoming to Black women. The fa uh, famous uh, parade in March of 1913 was deemed a march for white women. And when the founders of the then newly established Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated uh, conveyed their desi desire and intent to participate, uh, that caused major issues. Uh, the entire movement was almost compromised because of racism, according to some of the white suffragettes. Uh, and so we were not welcomed in that movement. Uh, the same women fighting for their rights didn't see them in connection to ours. Uh, there was widespread concern that by having Negro women participate, their efforts would be compromised. 
so you'll have to pardon me, and some may clutch their pearls, but Susan B. Anthony is no hero in the eyes of many Black women. And that's acknowledging that she was friends with Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, uh, if you, you know, go by a loose interpretation of friends. Uh, but she ultimately chose whiteness over solidarity with Black women. History tells us she wasn't a blatant racist, uh, but she did later ask Frederick Douglass not to come to Atlanta in 1865. The solidarity thing was and is still complicated. Uh, she petitioned lawmakers to give voting rights to their wives and daughters over Sambo in them, quote unquote. So next slide. Uh, again, um, just looking at the black women uh, in the suffrage movement, there was obviously Ida B. Wells, who's known uh, as a fire spitter uh, and truth teller, as is a Mary Church uh, Terrell, who talks about sort of the, the two strategies that we had to employ at the same time. Uh, she, Mary, Mary Church Terrell agreed to participate in the march under segregated conditions, whereas um, Ida B. Wells refused to march in the back and instead marched with the delegation that she came with. Um, I will skip over some of this just because I know I'm running a little bit over and I want to ensure that I can at least get through to the end and pass the mic. Next slide. Again, the 19th Amendment. Uh, shouldn't have even been required because the 15th Amendment should have given all citizens the right to vote. Uh, I will list their names as some um, of some of the women who will lead uh, just because it's important to uh, ensure that we are not erasing Black women who fought for our rights. Uh, that is, of course, Ella Baker, Septima Clark, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ruby Doris Robinson, Joanne Richardson, and so many others. Next slide. And you'll see uh, the founders of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated pictured here, uh, and not because I am a member, but just because I am a history lover, uh, because of their pivotal role uh, in fighting for um, the liberation of all women, not just some women. Uh, you'll see me and my sorority sisters over uh, at the top, well, we're all here, uh, but uh, the top right, uh, that is us living out our legacy, marching for humanity and against the separation of children from their parents something we know happened historically to Black women uh, and Black families during enslavement. You will also see Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, uh, who once served as the national president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, uh, in her capacity as chair of the House Administration Subcommittee on Election. Uh, so she is uh, still leading the way regarding protecting our rights to vote. So this year alone, she has, she has traveled uh, many states and held hearings about voting rights, uh, the abuses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I can go on and on and on as a history nerd and as an adjunct professor, but again, I wear too many hats to name them all and I will pass the mic. Thank you so much and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Ajwa. Um, acknowledging the role that we just discussed um, regarding intersectionality, um, please explain to our audience I'm sorry, um, what is intersectionality and what impact does this concept have on electoral policies and equity? Is, is this for me specifically? Or yes, this is for you specifically. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, okay. Can you read the question again? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, I asked what is intersectionality and what okay. impact does this concept have on electoral policies and um, equity? Okay. So I think that... Um, what I've just shared uh, makes intersectionality uh, critically important. Of course, some of us um, have, you know, dual identities. So, for example, my identity as an African is not separated from my identity as a woman. Um, I show up as my full authentic self. And so uh, we need to, you know, just recognize that we shouldn't ask people to separate parts of who they are. Uh, for some, you have, you know, religious identity, you have um, you know, orientation. And so intersectionality simply acknowledges that we are full beings uh, and that sometimes we, you know, kind of exist with this duality that other people don't understand. In terms of its importance um, in electoral politics, it's for all of the reasons that I just shared. Um, Black women, at this point, we are on, officially on the, bob, bob, um, on the ticket. Um, and it is important for us to, you know, just acknowledge that as sort of evidenced in the video that you shared, which of course um, sort of featured all of our uh, sorority sisters as well, is that we have to ensure that we are at the table and that we are making spaces. We are not equitably represented at all, whether it be the state legislatures and Congress uh, as mayors, et cetera, et cetera, 
And so for us, we need to ensure that we are constantly pushing the needle forward to ensure that there is true inclusion and so that that reality of the 19th Amendment that some people are celebrating really becomes the reality for all of us and that that concept of democracy that we were fighting for that didn't include us actually does. Absolutely, definitely the definition of creating a more perfect democracy and union. I'm going to turn it over to Allison. I think we have Maggie up next. Sure, and I'm just gonna pivot really fast. So, so Maggie, you're with League of Women Voters, which as an institution um, has an incredible legacy for empowering women uh, in democracy. So um, I know you have a couple of initial thoughts you wanna share about both from your history and sort of how that's relevant right now. Um, and, then, and then we wanna sort of drive home what's next after that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Maggie. Great, and can someone, um just give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Great. Um, so I, like, like Allison said, thanks everyone for having me. It's, it's um, always an honor to come together with the independent sector team and um, even virtually and not at your fabulous conference in real life. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for the, um, the speakers who came before me. This has been just an incredible context setting um, part of a, a conversation. So. The League of Women Voters was founded uh, directly out of the suffrage movement that we just um, heard about, which was flawed in many ways. And um, my, my co-panelists did a better job than I ever could of explaining all the ways in which that was the case. Um, so while we are celebrating our 100th year as an organization, we are also um, fully and publicly owning the fact that it was not inclusive, nor was our organization in its founding days. And I think that is um, something that is on all of our minds as we are moving forward and trying to best serve voters um, this year in, the, in, the, in spite of unprecedented challenges for us as a sector, as nonprofit leaders, and as people who are trying to empower the people in our lives and our networks uh, to vote. I'll just briefly, for people who aren't familiar with the League, um, tell you kind of where we are and what we do. We are active in 750 local communities around the country. Many of our local chapters have been around, um, some of them even since before the 19th Amendment was passed. So we have long, deep, um, deep roots in communities. We're active in every state and we have um, over 400,000 people engaging in our organization one way or another. We've already served uh, over 2 million voters online this year, just in the primaries. Um, we expect that'll be about 10 million total by the time November rolls around. So we're well ahead, That just for context, that's well ahead of where we were in the last comparable election, so in 2016. Um, so I think we are fully expecting high turnout as well as many, many challenges um, and many, many concerns about voting. Clearly, I don't need to recap all of it, but um, we know that voters, especially women, especially women of color and especially women who many of us in nonprofit roles serve um, are those most disproportionately affected by COVID and certainly those who tend to be most disproportionately affected by voter suppression and lack of good voting information and um, tend to get uh, entangled in the, the changes that happen, whether maliciously or not, uh, to our elections uh, processes and that is unfolding right now across the country. Um, just to give a sense, we're, we have major voter empowerment campaigns going on. That's, that's where I do most of my work, working with partners and with our field of, of affiliates around the country to do as much get out the vote and voter registration um, and programmatic partnership work as we possibly can to reach to reach all of those 10 million voters we're working to reach. Uh, but on the voting rights side, um, we're, we internally are setting up a rapid response process just within our own organization to be better and faster and as responsive as we possibly can as all these changes are sort of happening. Um, we're working overtime with the media to quickly react, uh, especially around key primary dates when we had people showing up to polling places only to find out they were closed. And of course that does disproportionately happen in black and brown communities um, where we had at the last minute as COVID was kind of crashing into presidential primaries um, back in March and April, we saw just huge massive confusion about what to do. And of course with the recent um, misinformation coming from every level of uh, government and every place in our country about the postal service and how to go about voting, 
um, we expect that that will just continue to be a, a huge challenge for us and for, for all the organizations who work on voting rights and advocate for voters. Uh, we ourselves are engaged in 50 plus lawsuits right now. Um, most of those are related directly to COVID voting changes. And I just heard from our litigation um, expert on staff this morning that um, more than 15 of those remain sort of open. We're not sure how they're gonna wind up. So that's everything from um, uh, how, how voters will be able to acquire a mail-in ballot to whether um, voting roll purges will be allowed to move forward, which could again disproportionately impact women and women of color uh, in, in some of the key states that, uh, that are, that are uh, first speakers, Heather and I think Jessica, I hope I'm getting your name right, uh, shared. So that map of states um, overlaps very clearly with where we're seeing these big challenges and threats of suppression. Um, from how will signatures be matched? If I submit my mail-in ballot, how will the poll, the poll worker who checks that ballot um, make sure that my signature matches? Is that happening in a fair way? And again, that disproportionately tends to impact black and brown voters and those who, um, those who are uh, new Americans or don't speak English as a first language. So again, many, many of the people that we are all serving in our roles as nonprofit leaders. Um, so we're working to overcome that. Uh, a, in the courts, we have had a lot of wins. We expect some more wins. Um, but even win or lose on these, on these lawsuits and voting rights campaigns, we have to do a ton of public education to get the word out. And um, I am gonna, my next slide will talk about what we all can do as nonprofit leaders um, in the league. Just a couple examples. Um, many, many of our affiliates are doing massive post, uh, postcarding campaigns. So writing postcards to voters who have moved since the last election, doing tons of student outreach. Many of you probably in your roles serve people who have been displaced by COVID. So we have a, a looming eviction crisis that's affecting many people who are, um, who are served by nonprofits. We have tons of students around the country who have been displaced or will not be voting in the place where they thought they would be this year. And that may affect how they go about the process. Um, so just thinking about all the people that you serve and interact with, um, even if you think they're a highly registered and engaged group of people, even within your own family or your social network, it's likely that they have questions. Um, you know, I had to figure out for my own family how we were going to go about voting. I, I'm Allison's neighbor. I'm in Arlington, Virginia, and we're going to be voting by mail for the first time. And we had to figure out how that was going to work, right? I didn't know that. And I do this 24 hours a day, you know, all, all year long, every year. So um, everybody, every voter is going to have questions, I think. Um, in Florida, just as an example, our league and partners uh, are calling on the phone uh, or writing postcards to about 80,000 people they've identified who have a prior conviction and thus uh, have newly restored voting rights for the first time and maybe need good information about how to get registered and how to make sure they're able to vote, especially because there's been mass uh, disinformation about even that particular expansion of rights in Florida and lots of moves to, um, even though Florida voters resoundingly supported restoring rights for, for folks, um, then there was a move to take those to take that away again by uh, by the legislature. So uh, there, that's just an example, a couple examples of things that we are doing. Um, but because a, a lot of you said that you haven't done voter engagement yet, um, I just wanted to point out. And the folks at Nonprofit Vote, I just have to plug them. They do incredible work. They run uh, National Voter Registration Day, which we heard about. Uh, which is coming up on September 22nd. They put out tons of research and trainings for nonprofits, whether you're uh, doing this for the first time or, um, or have been doing voter engagement for a long time. Their research tells us that voters who are engaged by nonprofit organizations turn out as much as 11% higher, which is so exciting. Uh, it shows that you, know, you as trusted organizations in your communities are critical to turning out the vote and reaching voters who, again, don't tend to have good access to information about how voting works or how it has changed in their community. Um, you're, of course, critical to building access within our democracy and making sure our electorate actually looks like our communities in terms of um, the diversity of, of voices who are taking part. And you're also probably um, among the most active 
organizations who are interfacing with people impacted by COVID right now. And so um, again, who tend to be many of the same people who are disproportionately impacted by voting changes that we're seeing and challenges and voter suppression. So, um, you know, it really, you matter. Um, your role in this matters. Here are a couple simple things that you can do. Um, certainly, if you are directly engaging with people, we know that there are so many people in this country who don't have online access, right? And even though we feel like we're sitting on Zoom all day, <laughs> uh, many of us, many, many people are not. So if you are interfacing directly with people in the community, this is the time to start putting out, whether it's um, just a little sheet of paper um, in a package of food you're handing out or in a packet that you're leaving at someone's door, um, something about voting. Your local League of Women Voters um, most likely has something they will give you uh, to print or will even just drop off printed copies of their local voting information. Um, we have tons of downloadable graphics on our own site. Our Vote 411 platform is the one I've mentioned that has all these changes for every state in America. Um, we have printable postcards for that just to, to send people to if they do have internet access. Um, but our local leagues are also very likely to have materials for people who don't have that access. Um, the National Voter Registration Day website that I mentioned is also an incredible source of information as is Rock the Vote and there are uh, a number of other partner organizations. Um, the Election Protection Hotline, which is the 866-R-Vote hotline I have listed here at the end, um, is absolutely a great number to have written down in your own office um, to share out with anybody you encounter who's having a challenge with voting um, as we get into the early voting period in different states, so around October time. That will be staffed live by lawyers and a large network of voting rights experts to help voters make sure they get their vote, vote cast and counted correctly. Um, and, you know, find out now about how early voting and mail voting is going to be working in your state. And all we can encourage people is to act early and to encourage the people in our lives to act early right now on voting. Um, uh, we just, we know that there's just going to be challenges. The more of us who act early, um, the less pressure that puts, the more, the more pressure that takes off our election and workforce, our poll workers, um, and the people who will be lining up to vote on November 3rd, because there will be many who still need to vote in person or choose to vote in person on November 3rd. And uh, the more of us who take action early, the, um, the less, you know, the less likely they are to be turned away because of a long line or uh, discouraged by something like that. So um, I will stop there. I know we're short on time, but I'm happy to answer questions in the chat if anyone has them. Thanks, Maggie. I, your presentation was so thorough, like you hit all of the questions that I had. So that's oh, um, good. <laughs> um, and and so one of the things that I want to do is make sure we we talk to a nonprofit that's doing this work. Um, it's it's kind of easy to say as an independent sector, everybody else should be doing this. But we also know, like none of us have enough time in the day. We're all staying up late at night to get our work done. And this just feels like one more thing that we have to do despite the fact that it's critically important. Um, and I, and so we need to have a conversation about like, what does it really entail for nonprofits to try to help the communities they serve vote? Because not only is it just important for democracy, but um, if the communities we serve vote, that actually gives nonprofits a, a greater voice when they go to talk to elected officials because the officials know they're accountable to the people who we represent. Um, but how do we make that happen in a way that fits into this crazy COVID environment? So with that, I'm gonna to turn to Christy with Share Our Strength. Christy, you guys are doing amazing things. Some of it is like the top tier level things you could be doing around voter engagement, but you also have strategies for like small things nonprofits could be doing. So could you just share with us um, what Share Our Strength, why do you guys do voter engagement? Because you're not a democracy organization. And then some of the strategies you're using this year, particularly when the elections are really confusing and a lot of things are changing. Absolutely. And I wanted to start off by saying thank you for this. I have found this to be so inspirational and aspirational. And I love the quote about how we're fighting not in petticoats, but in pantsuits. I thought that was fantastic. I'd like to amend it because uh, I'm actually in cutoff sweatpants and flip-flops that you can't see. So I'm gonna put the COVID piece on that as well because just because I'm not fancy right now doesn't mean I'm not in the fight. 
Um, but I'm so excited to share some of the things that we're doing. Look, we don't have all the answers. We have the answer that works for us. And there might be things here that other people want to adopt uh, and other strategies might be completely different. Uh, but to keep it short, I'll just walk you through our three E's, um, engage, encourage, and elevate. So the first E is engage. And this was one of our most important first steps, which was to engage our own staff and partners and talk about why this is so mission critical for us to be involved in. Like you said, we're not a democracy organization. We're an anti-childhood hunger organization. Uh, we fight poverty and hunger and fight for opportunity both globally, but here, right here in the United States. Um, and so some of the things you hear from people are, but I don't have any capacity or my workload is already so huge. Uh, why do this? And I say, we don't have the luxury not to do this. Uh, right now, kids are, in my world, kids are hungry right now. I don't have the luxury to push pause and say, you know what, we're going to pick this up after the election. Everyone just hold on till, till November, December when we, we get this back. So one of the real reasons that uh, we engage in Get Out the Vote beyond just being the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, and the way to build a greater society is that's where the news cycle and public attention is going to be uh, for the next few weeks. And so when we engage our um, supporters and the people we serve on getting out the vote, and we continuously say, get out the vote, it's important for kids. Get out the vote, it's important for our issue. We're not only getting out the vote, we're keeping our issue front and center. And it stays front and center for potential, uh, this potential new crop of leaders as they come in and elected officials down the road. Um, second is encourage. And that's giving people easy tools that they can use to encourage them to take the steps uh, to get out there and vote. Um, you know, personally, listening to all of these stories and the things that people talked about today, um, this power that we have, those of us who have it, has been so hard fought. Women have marched and been jailed and fought. And now I'm not going to vote because it's raining outside? No way. We all uh, have the duty and responsibility to do justice to our foremothers, four sisters, and grandmothers who fought to give us um, this, this uh, incredible power. Um, so some of the ways that we are doing that at No Kid Hungry, um, we are engaging in Register to Vote Day on National Register to Vote Day on September 22nd. And Rock the Vote has a widget that you can put on your co-brand and put on your website. My, my social team told me it was a snap. And um, it allows uh, you to check and see if you have registered to vote. So we're just going to say, hey, while you're here and we're talking about these issues, take a quick second, see if you're also registered to vote. Uh, we also have developed a bunch of stickers that we're going to be using all through October because, you know, November 3rd is, is not just election day. October is election month. We've got to get people out there and voting all month long. And so we've got these great stickers that say, I voted and I already voted and I already voted, have you? That we're encouraging people to put on their Instagram and Twitter and social feeds. They're non-branded, um, we'll circulate them after this. Anyone can use these in your own work, save people a step if you, if you wanna use them. Uh, and then that week before the election, we're just going to start a drumbeat on social media and with our networks, newsletters and things to say, do you have a plan around voting? What steps are you going to take uh, to make a plan, find a friend uh, if you've not already voted to vote? And then my third E is elevate. Look, we are all really busy and overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, I don't know what day it is. I was 20 minutes early to this call because I knew if I wasn't, I wouldn't be here until next Thursday. So how can we make this as streamlined as possible? And I say borrow from the best. League of Women Voters have incredible resources, use them. Uh, Rock the Vote has incredible resources. Nonprofit Vote uh, is fantastic, especially around a lot of the legal stuff and the questions that we have as nonprofit, making sure that we're doing this in a nonpartisan manner. Um, so find the people with the resources and use them, elevate them. Retweet is gonna be my best friend this season. And so we're getting a lot of that information out there. So sorry to kind of zip through that, but that's why we do what we do, why it's so important to us as an organization and engage, encourage and elevate how we're actually going to do this at a time when we're already so busy. Christy, thank you so much. I, 
I mean, the, I do, I'm a little relieved, although we kind of did go through a lot. We covered a lot of territory. It was all really meaty. And what I hear even in the chat is like, I think people would love to, to dive deeper. We do want to be mindful of people's time. So I want to offer something, which is, um, I think we're going to modify our program a little bit, but we want to still give people who have questions a chance to ask questions, to dive deeper on some things that they may have heard, um, understanding we're coming up against our three o'clock timeline. So I'm going to invite those who are able, stay on the call with us, um, ask the questions. We'll stay on for a little bit longer for um, the speakers who can. Um, if you cannot, we completely understand. Also, we will keep recording. So when we send this recording out, um, we will, uh, you will be able to view it. Um, but we'll, we'll see what, what we can kind of grab onto in the last five, 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, thank you all. I know some of, some of you will need to leave, um, but I really do wanna thank you for, for your time today. I really loved what I heard. It's made me think about um, voting, um, my identity as a woman and my identity as a nonprofit employee differently. Um, and, and, you know, I helped Nisha plan this thing. So the fact that I've learned things I think is really insightful. So with that, I'm going to pivot over to Nisha. And then if you, if you guys need to drop off, we understand. Um, but Nisha, can we, can we just jump into maybe a conversation um, or a Q and A from folks? Sure thing. Um, for any of our viewers, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them in the question box. Um, for our panelists, um, is it possible for us to perhaps maybe address some of the challenges that are associated with nonprofit engagement, whether it be because of limited capacity, bandwidth issues, things of that nature, acknowledging that the electoral system this year in 2020 and with COVID has been challenged in ways that I, I don't think any of us could have ever imagined. How should we be trying to get engaged in the month of September with November quickly approaching? And why should nonprofits take up this issue, even if it's not necessarily our direct mission to do voter engagement or civic engagement? Um, I just want to uh, say I do have to drop off right at three, but I want to take that question um, quickly to say, you know, Christy made the great point that um, <clears throat> there are organizations out there that have great, great resources. And so um, and, you know, mine happens to be one of them, but there are many, many others. And um, she said, you know, you, you all are doing critically important work that has nothing to do with voting um, on its face, although it all is connected, of course, to your, to your points, uh, everybody. But, um, you know, but there are people whose job it is to do this. And that's, you know, that's my job. That's Rock the Vote's job. That's National Voter Registration Day's job. And I think as a sector, uh, within the sector, we are getting better at making shareable easy to grab and lift up things. And so um, talking about this in September, talking about the various pieces of voting is just so important right now. Um, we need to be talking about registration, but also these issues of how is voting working in your state? Um, and <clears throat> how might it be different? And do you know that if you've moved, you might need to take some action right now? Um, and pointing back to trusted sources and repeating that information. Um, just a few ways, even dropping a link into emails, um, even, um, even you know, making sure that in the very least your own employees have that good information in case somebody asks them is, uh, is a small but really critical and important step. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Um, one more quick question. Uh, this is something that we hear frequently about how voting and voter engagement is often perceived as a partisan issue. Perhaps um, our experts, Heather and Jessica, could chime in on to how nonprofits should engage in this issue in a nonpartisan way. Sure, I think a couple of items to talk there, you know, voting is a civic right and voting <laughs> in and of itself should not be a, a partisan issue. But I think if when you, you know, look at the language that you're using, you want to be using language that is inviting to everyone. And it's hard, um, you know, to, to really, ha you know, have see someone blaming you for that. Jessica, I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, but I do um, have two items that I want to raise for you, Jessica and I, we're gonna throw a few of them out. So maybe I'll throw these two out. And then Jess, you can add any you wanna add. But um, 
it's also hard to engage with your members. Christy, you talked a lot about how you're trying to, you know, grow these people who understand your organization and will want to continue to engage with you. And one of the questions that I think Jessica and I get frequently is, well, what do I do now? I can't bring all of my people up to the hill to go knock on doors because that's not happening. Um, and so I want to give you one thing you've probably thought of and one thing you might not have. Um, one thing that you can do is members are still having meetings and so are staff and they're doing a lot of zoom calls just like this and they're happy to do them with you and you might even be able to bring a better view of who you are in this format than you could with the three or four people that could come with you to Washington. So think about who you're serving, bring them on to tell the story, invite more people at your organization to join the meeting. Um, you could put together a pretty compelling opportunity to engage with that member and their staff, even though it's a different format. The other thing, and this is not something that um, nonprofits are usually comfortable doing, and it feels a little dirty to some people, but I want to tell you it's a powerful tool and it is on discount now, and that is fundraising. Um, members are having to try to convince people to give them money over the internet, and it is hard for them, and they are doing it at a discount. And it gives you an opportunity to be face to face on equal ground with all those big corporations and their fancy packs. If you call their fundraiser right now and say, I have two, I don't have $2,000, but I have $200 and I want to attend a fundraiser, dollars to donuts, they're going to find a space to fit you in. And when you're on that call, that member of Congress is not going to see that difference. What they're going to hear is the story and they're going to be so grateful to talk to someone that they want to actually talk to. So I encourage you to think about those two items between now and October. All right, Jessica. Yeah, I, I think those are great um, pieces of advice. I'll add up, follow up with two more. Um, you know, as far as the content, when you do get in the room with a member of Congress or with an elected official, um, one is I always encourage my clients Think about, you know, it's not about the theoretical, it's about what it is that you actually do and tell that story. So, you know, it can be really great to say we uplift communities by empowering women, um, which I think a lot of your organizations do a great job of. It makes a lot more sense and policymakers and staff um, can really understand better when you say something to the extent of, you know, we provide low cost uh, childcare options for single moms so they can earn a living, right? That, in their mind, um, you know, I think they're more practical than theoretical. And so when you kind of can um, really spell that out, it's, that's a really powerful um, tool. The second one, Nisha, you mentioned kind of um, politics and kind of what that looks like. And I think, um, you know, clients both on the business side and in the nonprofit world are always really surprised as far as where um, um, you know, members um, have their interests. And while I think we, you know, we talk about all politics are local, um, think of where your um, footprint is in terms of the communities that you serve um, and where you have offices um, and look at those members. Um, maybe not necessarily, you know, if you don't have a footprint um, in uh, Massachusetts, for example, Senator Warren might not be a great um, person to go to, but if you have some really great work that you do in Arizona, for example, um, there's some really great, you know, Kristen Sinema is a great um, example of a senator that would be great to, to go to and to talk about. Um, those elected officials are more likely to listen to your stories because you're the constituents that they really want to hear from, um, and they'll be more receptive than someone that may be where you don't have necessarily um, a stronger foothold. So I was going to just um, chime in for a second, Nisha, and respond. One thing, Heather, so the fundraising is a great idea, but I do want to remind folks that when you go, you are representing yourself and not your nonprofit organization. Um, and you can say, I work for a nonprofit, and these are the things that I care about as a voter, which just so happen to be the things that your nonprofit works on, but you're not representing your organization. So I just want to make sure I make that clear. Great example, nuanced. Um, I, Nisha, if it's okay, I have a question for. Yeah. Our, um, if it's okay, so the last six months or so, although we have known for a long time about uh, racial inequities and systemic racism, we've seen a light shine on it across multiple topics, right? So it's like it's not it's like the COVID impact, the dis the disproportionate uh, economic impact. It's looking at uh, uh, police violence and even beyond police violence how civil, civic activism is treated differently based on your race or gender. Um, I'm just curious, uh, looking at this current context and, and thinking about what is at stake here um, from this idea of like making sure people can vote in the context of 2020, in the context of 
the, the racial, racism and inequality that we're seeing. If you have any thoughts there. Well, I always have thoughts. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think you raised a critically important point um, in terms of just acknowledging even what racial equity means. Sometimes we, you know, string together words and don't necessarily understand, you know, what the approach actually is. So in short, without giving a full lesson on racial equity, um, it seeks to um, acknowledge historical wrongs and to right them. And so even engaging in this space of electoral politics and, you know, just voter civic engagement, voter engagement, um, through racial equity lens looks to um, essentially look at what are the barriers uh, that voters face. And to the last question um, that Nisha raised, just if I could just, uh, you know, veer off for a second. Um, it is important for us to note that fighting for civil rights should not be the responsibility of one party. I know that it's oftentimes thought of in that way, which is a whole nother, you know, session if I'm ever privileged enough to be invited back. But it really is not. It should not be the responsibility of one gender, of one race, or one party. So I just wanted to add that point uh, to the question. But to your point specifically, I think that it is important to look at the barriers, to look at what the voter suppression uh, tactics that are having, um, that are, you know, what those tactics, the impact that it's having on our community. I just uh, participated in a briefing and I can tell you that it is a very well-funded and sophisticated effort uh, to ensure that people who were already marginalized when it comes to participating in democracy actually don't have the right to even participate in the process. And so um, I think that, that to the extent that you can, of course, wearing the nonprofit hats that, that we wear, um, and I should also note just because it's being recorded, we do not speak on behalf of our organization, although of course we belong to many uh, nonprofit organizations, but to the extent that you can't educate people educate people on the misinformation campaigns, the disinformation campaigns. We are now seeing vote by mail, which, you know, has not been, um, you know, something that we've all participated in, particularly black and brown communities, as well as young people. That hasn't always worked uh, for us. And so you have this distrust here uh, that is rooted in history that we have to acknowledge. So to the extent that you can actually educate people, um, you know, to just dispel the myths, uh, give people the education, provide resources, you know, point people directly to other nonpartisan, um, you know, organizations that can provide that information. I think all of that is important to ensuring that we all, all have equal access to the ballot box. I could not agree more. And I would also say in our role as nonprofits, the people who support us, the communities that we serve, the partners that we work with um, are of every gender, every age, every race, and so we are in this, this position of being able to build equity by building voices and equipping more and more people with their power to vote and the information they need, especially when they're busy um, and especially when they may not have that information easily. And so um, just as it's, it's, of course, everyone's duty to do this, but we're in this really unique position as nonprofit leaders. Absolutely. And then also tying into the point that Heather and Jessica and I know Maggie made it earlier. Um, this is just this provides an ample opportunity for nonprofit engagement for us to be able to illustrate the impact that nonprofits have to a point um, a statistic that she had in her slide earlier about how politicians, those who are incumbents and also seeking to, you know, to get voted into office often engage in communities that have higher voter turnout. That is an opportunity for nonprofits to literally get in front of these elected officials, let them know what our issues and priorities are and hold them accountable when they're actually elected into office. And to talk about issues sometimes. Yes, to talk about the issues that impact the communities that we serve, absolutely, so that everybody has a seat at the table. Policy is so important. I actually only work in politics because of the uh, possibilities on the policy side. Uh, sometimes even as a strategist, you know, the brand of parties is, is not always, you know, what people think it is, especially in certain communities. So talk about the policies, talk about the issues that are actually going to impact people. If you are tackling hunger, talk about what that means. Talk about, you know, what budgets, what votes, you know, actually are aligning, um, you know, with your organization. Because of course we can't wear a partisan hat, you know, always. And, you know, we all have our views, but 
um, we can talk about issues and we can certainly talk about policies and whether or not there is alignment between a piece of legislation without even necessarily talking about the party of the person who drafted it. So there are ways to, you know, lift issues and policy without talking about partisanship. Absolutely. And my last to point, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Even to the point of educating not only just stakeholders, but the communities we serve, you know, there is intersectionality in everything that we do, regardless of whether it's your mission, regardless of it's, you know, something that impacts your industry directly. If you care about police brutality and police reform, I mean, your police chief, your sheriff, those are elected positions. Your mayor who allocates a budget, that's an elected position. If we're talking about voter suppression, most secretaries of states and most, most of your states, it's an elected position. Um, I think there's an opportunity to combat a lot of misinformation and, and nonprofits are the most trusted resource to be able to do so. My, my final word on this and before I have to bolt is um, for nonprofits, especially those who have not done a whole lot of this in the past, start small. I think the number one thing that stops nonprofits from doing this is it feels so daunting and it looks like there's so much to do. So don't do all of it. Uh, pick two or three things. Um, we, we started off by putting, have you voted or are you registered in our email signatures? Boom, that's, that's one easy way to get things out the door. Uh, things on social media, sharing, like I said, retweets, best friends. Um, and so um, don't be daunted or discouraged by all of the options out there. Sit down and just pick a few small ones. And before you know it, they do start to grow as you see how it actually helps lift up the work itself, as well as being part of our civic duty. I think, Christy, that is the perfect note to end on. I will do a plug for, um, from an independent sector standpoint, we worked on a campaign a few years ago with Nonprofit Vote called Nonprofit Votes Count. The point of that campaign was just to get nonprofits to educate their own staff. Like that's it, just start with your, your peers in your organization. And this year that is so relevant because as Maggie said, she works for a voting organization and she didn't know how to vote by mail. I didn't either. This is the first time I'm going to do that. So um, I think if we're just looking for a first step, it's how can I help my peers and my organization navigate this process? And then by doing so, they probably can share that information out with their networks. So I want to thank all of you so much for all of the content you provided. Thank you, um, everyone who's hung in here on, on the call. This has been really informative and fun. I do feel a little like it was a celebration slash call to action for us. Um, we will be sending it out in a little dance. We'll be sending out a, um, an email tomorrow. It will include a recording of this as well as a link to some of the resources we talked about today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to let everyone get back to their afternoon right before holiday weekend. Everybody enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much for your time.